Hi everyone, Josh from PH Tennis. I'm here today to do a quick tip on changing your follow through height. Now this is applicable to forehand and backhand, but we're gonna be looking at the forehand specifically. Now, you'd have heard coaches a lot of the time, a lot for a long time say, swing low to high, finish on your shoulder. And whilst that's true for a particular type of forehand, we need to vary that follow through height depending on where we are on the court. Let's get into it. Okay, so if you find yourself further back from the baseline, you need to have your follow through higher. You need the party racket to go steeper so your ball can go high and deep. So you see my follow through is ending up higher than my shoulder and that gives us nice depth. Now, if I did that same shot with that same follow through from the baseline, the ball is now gonna go too far. And it's gonna go out by about the same distance that I just moved up the court. So to counteract that, I have to reduce my follow through height. So whereas when I was back here, I was finishing above my shoulder, I'm now from the baseline gonna to go to my shoulder, that more traditional tip that coaches give, follow through to your shoulder and you see it worked. Now I could do that from back here as well, but you'd have the same difference. The ball would then be too short as it would come up. Let's now move up the court. Okay, so now if I find myself inside the baseline, again, I need to flatten out that follow through and that path of the racket. So I had it above my shoulder, then on the baseline, I had it to my shoulder, and now I'm gonna come below my shoulder and round. So again, you can see the outcome of the ball is the same. They're all deep just inside the baseline. Again, if I use that same one from back on the baseline, they're suddenly gonna drop short, maybe go in the net. Even more extreme, if I fern come even further up the court towards the service line, I'm gonna need an even flatter and quicker follow through to get up and down so I can work the ball low. To keep it in. I can't use that same follow through. I can't use that same height from on the base and or behind. I have to adapt. And changing your follow through is the easiest way to do that. So to recap, behind the baseline, above my shoulder. From the baseline, to my shoulder, from inside the baseline, round towards my elbow, and from right up the court, quick up and down to keep it in. Adjust that follow through height depending on where you are. Don't stick to the always follow through to your shoulder. You might think you need to change loads of to do of your forehand for those different shots, but if you have the same setup and take back, but just alter that follow through, it's a really easy way to build a whole court game. Don't always follow through to your shoulder, adapt and thrive. If you enjoyed this tip, please like, follow and subscribe. Hi everyone, Josh from PH Tennis. This is a tip all about using our non-dominant hand. So our left hand or our non-dominant hand uh, does lots of really important things. Um, and I'm gonna go through a few of those with you now. So the first thing it does is as you turn, as the ball is played towards you, it gives you the right amount of space you need between your body and the contact. All right, so as the ball comes and my racket comes out, I'm giving myself with a nice straight left arm the same distance every time. If my left arm comes off my racket, I don't know exactly where my contact's gonna be. So I'm essentially marking to my body, I'm gonna contact the ball here, so then as I do my swing and it come back through, it will meet the ball at that same place. So it looks a little bit like this. So my left hand stays on until I'm behind the ball, and you can see on every single one of those, my distance between my body and the contact was the same. Now that doesn't mean your shot will be the same. Maybe you're using topspin, maybe you're playing the ball flat, maybe you're using slice, but your distance between you and the ball needs to be the same so you can build a repeatable rhythm. So the key to the tip here is that your left arm stays straight. If your left arm has got any flex in it, you'll never know how much flex that's supposed to be. How much bend did you have last time? If your left arm doesn't grow, it will be the same. If you hold the racket in the same place, no matter where you go, your racket will stay still in the same position so your distance will be the same. So we locate the ball and play the shot. So a really common mistake that we see people make all the time is when they've moved off their kind of comfortable spot, which might be the baseline as they are pushed, uh, pushed back or pulled forwards or wide, their 
body doesn't turn. So when the ball is really comfortable and they get this nice position here, it looks great. But as they're moved wide, they end up kind of open and stretched. Or as they come forwards, they run forwards towards the ball. So it's really important we keep our left arm across as we're moving, no matter where the ball goes. The side benefit of having this left arm across as well as locating the ball consistently, it means as our racket comes through, we can twist our body, creating some more force. That force might go into pure power through the ball, or maybe it will come into ripping up the ball to create more spin. Now, there's a really fine balance here between your left hand spinning out of control and twisting your body. Have a look. So you want your elbow to pull around as you twist. If your elbow doesn't bend, you end up with this wild spin and you'll go out of control. So we need our left arm to tuck in as we twist around. And naturally, that will pull our racket through, creating some more force. So that's the other really big benefit of using your left arm is it enables you to really rip and twist through your shot. So, in a more technical sense, when your left arm is across here, it allows you to activate your posterior sling system. Now this is a sling system that works across your body, and it means as your left arm is tight and is pulling in, it allows your right side to relax and come through in a more kind of relaxed and less stiff way. So, it's really important that the forehand is initiated from your left arm pulling, not your right side pushing. So by having a really strong and tight left arm, we can then have a really relaxed right side pulling through. So we're stretching and pulling in with the left, and that allows the right to just flow through with some speed. So that's the science. But to keep it simple, get that left arm straight, so you're gonna A, locate the ball consistently, and B, allow your body to work efficiently to pull that racket through. So one of the most common mistakes we see club players making all the time is their last step before their contact. So we've given ourselves nice space to the ball, and then as we come up to play the shot, Instead of stepping next to the ball, maintaining that width, players step towards the ball. So that last step comes here, taking away all the lovely width you just gave yourself, and you end up playing in that really tight space that you're trying to avoid in the first place. And it's really common as people move forwards up the court. As they move forwards, they run towards the bounce and their last step takes their space away from them. So it's really important that as you're playing, you step next to the ball, not at the ball. By maintaining that space, it allows us to have a nice, consistent um, amount of timing to the ball. The wrong way would look more like this. You can see the setup's almost the same, but as that contact comes in, I lose all the width that I've given myself. This is similar to you think about taking a penalty in football. That if you were going to kick that ball here, you wouldn't step across towards the ball, you would step next to the ball, allowing your foot to come straight through. And it's the same principle in tennis. We want to step next to the ball so our contact can then be beside us with the right amount of width. Finish with a good one. So give yourself width at the start, but then keep it. Don't take it away by moving across and stepping across yourself. Step next to the ball, make sure you're coming forwards, and you'll be ripping winners all over the place. Hi everyone, Josh from PH Tennis, and I'm here today to tell you our three fundamental truths about tennis. Now these are things that we think are always true that you can't argue against. 
that you might think there must be more than that. And, and there may well be. And actually, by the end of the video, if you think there's something else that is always true, please comment because we're not sticking to three. In a year's time, we might have four, we might have five. But so far, these are our three fundamental truths. So let's get started. Truth number one, and the most important truth is adaptability. Joe, did you put the adaptability up? Oh, hopefully. Um, so adaptability, that is your ability to change based on the situation that you're in, adapt to your environment. You can never just say, I'm gonna go out there today and play attacking tennis. That's playing out of ego. You need to play the situation, you need to play how you feel, the score, your opponent, what they are good at, what you're good at, the type of ball that you've got. And that ability to change and adapt and problem solve is always, always true. You always have to adapt to your situation. The real importance of that is if you're playing someone who is better than you, you don't play them. If you're playing someone who's worse than you, remember them, you play the ball, you adapt to the ball, you don't play any other way. So adaptability, you always must adapt. If you adapt, you thrive. Our second fundamental truth is get your racket behind the ball. Now, this is the only kind of semi-technical truth, but it lines up for every single shot. You need to get your strings behind the line of the incoming ball. So if you have a forehand, what a surprise, you need to get your racket out behind the ball on your forehand side. If it's coming to your backhand, you don't go out for a forehand, right? You get your strings lined up. Our third and final control truth is mental. Now, tennis, as everyone knows, is a very mental game about emotional control, about problem solving, coming up with ways to win. And it's something that lots of coaches talk about and say, oh, it's the most important skill. But what is it actually the fundamental truth of what your mentality can be when you play tennis? And that is, you can choose your own focus. You can choose what you are focusing on. You, no one else can control that. You can decide you're gonna try and be more positive. You can decide to make sure you're playing with more topspin. You can decide you're gonna try and serve and volley. You can decide to try and be calmer. No one can take that focus away from you. How many times have you been playing and that focus does go? You let your emotions take over. You forget that you can decide what you wanna focus on. And as soon as you get that control back and know that your mentality is yours, you're gonna find it so much easier. So. Those are our three truths so far. That final one, choose your focus. Get your racket behind the ball, and the most important, be ready to adapt. As I said at the start, if you think there's any more that we've missed out, anything else that is always true when you're playing a tennis match, please put it in the comments. We'd love to start some debate and see what we think. Welcome back everyone to our um, PH uh, tennis coaching channel. Today we're going to talk about the two types of different backhand slice. So in the last video we talked about the when and the why. Uh, this week we're going to talk a little bit more about the how. So the uh, two main ways in which you can receive a ball for the backhand slice are one if the ball is rising and two if the ball is dropping. So when the ball is rising, the type of slice that you want to use is a little bit more of a cut, a bit more of a knife in order to get that ball to uh, travel low over the net and cut through the court. The latter one uh, would be when the ball is dropping. Um, so the type of shot that you want to play is something a little bit more uh, of a lift or a bit more floaty. Um, and the reason that is because the ball is dropping, therefore the trajectory of the ball, if you try and knife it, it's just going to go straight into the net. So if you want to get that ball over the net and to have a good effect onto your opponent, uh, you still need, to, still need to get underneath the ball so the ball can rise above the net. So from the club players that I've seen out there, I think for the majority, most of them are good at one uh, because they're choosing um, to uh, go for the wrong type of shot, uh, depending on the ball that comes in. Um, so the best way to solve it is to try and um, do what we've just kind of explained um, and try and meet the ball at the right trajectory. Uh, if you like our stuff, uh, please like and subscribe and keep watching all our videos. Hi, this is Joe from PH Tennis um, and today I'm going to give you the closest thing we'd give you to a more sort of classic social media tip because it's that simple 
but giving it to you because it's also that effective. And it's about creating space on the backhand side. Now I play a two-handed backhand, but this, is, this works whether you play two-handed or play one-handed. And it's to use the non-dominant hand. So if you're playing a two-hander, that's the left hand. I'm a right-hander, sorry, that's the top hand on the racket. As we turn, we're gonna use our left hand to push that racket away from us, getting our left arm almost straight. And that's gonna give you the space to be able to play a much more controlled shot. So, much, so often with a two-hander, especially people jammed up like this, hooking the ball around, push that racket away and play from out there. Same goes for the one-hander, just gonna have a hand on the throat and as we turn, push that racket away. That's giving us the space in here to be able to play a beautiful one-hander. The reason that this works so well is that your left arm or your non-dominant arm is the same length. It's always the same length unless something strange happens. So as you push the racket away, you know that you're creating distance, so your setup is the same. So you're building in a very, very consistent setup, which is gonna to lead to consistent contact, which is gonna to lead to consistent ball characteristics. So use that non-dominant arm that's not changing in length, push the racket away from you, find better contact. If you like this tip if you want to know more check out our youtube channel if you're not watching there already follow us on instagram for all tips racket reviews anything that's going to help you improve your tennis game cheers uh, so we get a lot of questions um, as you know about something that seems so simple and that's the ball toss and funny enough i really struggle too i feel like it most of the time it's miles behind my head and I end up kicking when i don't want to so help me please no worries so there's actually two different kind of schools of thought um traditionally it's always been taught keep the ball kind of in your fingertips so then as your hand comes up you just open your hand and the ball will go straight up and it was actually mr moritoglu who suggested not to do that to keep it in your hand in your palm and push it up now i'm not saying one is right and one is wrong you need to try both and see which one works for you they both have their pros, they both have their cons. You need to figure out which one is for you to keep that ball in control. So that's about how you actually grip onto the ball. The next point, you need to have your arms straight. It isn't a throw, you don't throw the ball up. You place the ball up. So it's from your shoulder coming straight up, your elbow and your wrist stay straight. There's no uh, fl flexion, flexion's the word, isn't it? Yeah. There's no flexion in your elbow or wrist, uh, there's no flick. That's where the ball starts to go back behind you so you keep your arm nice and straight. And then, if you've got those two things together, the ball either in your fingertips or in your palm, whichever one you prefer, you've got your arm straight, it's then all about your release point. Now, for me personally, it's my nose level. If my ball starts down here and my arm stays straight, if I release and open my hand at nose level, but my hand follows the ball, I know the ball will drop straight back down into my hand. So in my fingertips is how I do it. Arm straight, up to the sky, open up my nose, and it will drop back down every single time. And that's how you perfect your ball toss. All right, show me. Help me, what's, show me what's wrong with mine. So let's have a look. Yeah, so I actually think you're caught between the two. You've kind of got it in your fingers and your palms. So you need to either get it into your palm or in your fingertips. Right front. There you go. Yes, yeah, so as you went up on that one, you pushed it behind you. So I think fingertips for you. Nice. Keep that arm dead straight, stretch up at the end. Nice. Better. Better? Yeah. It's interesting. So for Joe there, it was literally just a difference of whether it was fingertips or palm, and he was kind of caught in the bottom of his fingers. And as it came up, he was put, it was, you could see it flicking out. So he needed to release that tension and make sure it was looser in just his fingers. I'll give it a go. Thanks, Josh. You're welcome. Any time. Hi guys, Josh from PH Tennis. Super quick tip today about how to adapt to a change in court surface. Now, this is all about the, the change of court surface changes the speed of the ball and the type of bounce that you get. Obviously, the ball through the air is the same. It's after the bounce where the adaption has to happen. Now, so many players time their racket swing with the bounce of the ball. 
So if you do that, you get used to the timing of that ball, of that bounce on that particular surface. You wait for the ball to bounce, you start your racket. And so what we need to do is beat the bounce. We need to get our racket prepared and starting our shot before the bounce. So the timing can easily be translated across multiple surfaces. So when we're preparing our racket, we're always gonna make sure we go out behind the ball. We're trying to locate the line and the trajectory that we think we're gonna have. So our racket comes out away from us. You wanna get your racket out there early so you can prepare and be ready for your shot and not be reliant on the timing of the bounce of the ball. So we're preparing early to give us time to be able to adapt to that changing scenario that we find ourselves in with the change of court surface. Now remember, this isn't an always, this isn't a you must do it, it's something for you guys to go out there and try. Try and beat the bounce. See how early you can get your racket prepared, get your racket back so you can make sure you're timing the ball consistently and not being uh, so rigid based on the court surface and the speed of the balls that you're facing. Beat the bounce, it's that simple. Give it a go. So, okay, so what we're going to do, we're going to try think, focusing on your breathing, right? So the idea is we want to try and give you one thing to focus on. So it's almost meditative, right? So as that ball's coming towards you, you're going to breathe in. You know, exhale on contact. So kind of like the pros when they grunt. Right, we don't need to go that far. We're not trying to intimidate every, anyone. But we're just trying to make sure so we exhale and then breathe out for as long as possible afterwards. The longer and smoother we can make that breath, the more relaxed you're going to remain. Right, which is hopefully should play a little bit looser, um, keep your mind clear. So, because what we're doing is by slowing your breathing down, we're keeping your parasympathetic nervous system active, which is the opposite of fear, fight and flight. So, we want you to be calm, we want you to be relaxed. So, as soon as you get tense, you stop breathing. When you start breathing like too fast, the fear kicks in, body gets tight, brain shuts down, and then panic comes in. Hi guys, Josh from PH Tennis. This is a great tip for anyone who's trying to get better, who's trying to improve. And this is about understanding the stage of learning that you're in, okay? So we have five different stages of learning. We have the learn phase, the practice phase, the train phase, the test phase, and the compete phase. And every skill that you're trying to develop needs to be pass through each different stage. And if you skip one out, you'll find that it starts to break down the further through the list that you go. So, for example, if we were trying to learn uh, a topspin second serve, initially you've got to learn that feeling, you've got to learn how to create that spin. So that is going to be perfect to do in an individual lesson. One-on-one -on -one with a coach and giving you tips, trying to understand the shape, trying to understand the feel, is exactly what you should be doing. Equally, the next step from that is practicing it. That too probably is best done with a coach there to give you the right cues, to keep trying to develop it. And you're gonna be doing repetitions and repetitions and repetitions, really trying to practice that skill and understand how that feels. We're then gonna to start to train the skill. So sticking with that example, it might be that we do our second serve and then we, th then we play another shot. Or we do a first serve, then a second serve, and we rotate sides. So it's not just that skill on repeat, we're starting to break it up with other things. Now, the test, we have to start making it competitive, but in a scenario that doesn't matter. So there's not that huge amounts of pressure. So this is gonna be perfect to be done with, with, with another player, um, a practice match, uh, a group training session, a chance for you to use that kick serve and, and develop it into your game without that undue pressure of, well, if it breaks down, if it fails, it really matters. And once you've got through that phase, it's time to use it in competition and see if your new top spin second serve really adds something to your game. Now, this is the really important bit and the, the, and the power of this is that one of those stages, your new shot, your new skill will probably break down if you're trying to learn something new. And what you don't have to do is go, I didn't work in the match, I need to learn it again. You probably don't need to do that. You've probably already learned the skill. Maybe you didn't practice it enough. Maybe you didn't train it enough. Maybe you haven't tested it enough. Or maybe you just need to compete more and more and more and more to get it in. Maybe you just weren't quite ready there. So next time you're learning something new or you're doing a lesson, think about what stage of learning the bit, the bit that you're trying to develop is in to make sure that the structure that you're doing and the content that you're doing actually matches. So to remind you, we learn, we practice, we train, we test, and then we compete. And you need to know which stage of learning you're in 
at all times when you're on a tennis court. If you get them modelled up, you're going to find it much harder to progress. Thanks for watching this tip. Uh, if you enjoyed it and would like some more, please hit the subscribe button. We're uploading videos almost every day. Uh, we'd love to get your feedback, so please like, comment and subscribe. Hi everyone, Josh from PH Tennis here today with just a tip on our danger words. Now these are words that we hear people use all the time and they're often misused and misunderstood because of that. Firstly, we've got hit. It's too broad, it's not clear enough. So telling someone to hit it more softly, hit it harder, hit it faster, not clear enough. Why can't we use a proper sensation? Let's try using brush, rip, guide, roll. Choose a sensation, not a generic term. Consistency, confused with repeatability. So when we say consistency, we're talking about a consistent outcome, um, which you can't disagree with, but it's how you achieve that consistent outcome that is important. So we want to make sure we're avoiding repeatability as in consistently doing the same thing and instead making sure we're adapting to every situation, adapting to the incoming ball, adapting to our environment and therefore achieving consistency through consistent adaptation. Forget the last point, move on. You don't want to forget the last point. So a really common trope you hear all the time from coaches and commentators and even professionals is, I'll oh, just forget about it, move on, last point's in the rear window, get on with it, focus on the next thing, always positive. But the last point's where all your information was. If you're making horrific tactical decisions, would it not make more, more sense to pay attention to the last point? You need to move on from it emotionally and not let that cloud your judgment, but you need to learn, you need to use the data from your opponent and from your shots to improve for the future. Always, never, just be very, very careful how they're used. There are some things that are absolutely true, but they are very few. If anyone ever tells you to always play a certain shot in a certain situation, don't listen to them. You need to be adaptable, you need to be creative, you need to find your own solutions. There's no one size fits all, because it all depends on everything that's going on around. If you want a more in-depth look into any of our danger words and what words we use instead, subscribe to our channel. We've got more videos coming out soon. Hi, Joe from PH Tennis, and today we're going to talk about when to play the drop shot. Now, obviously court position, your opponent's court position plays a role, but I'm talking about how to choose the right time to play it based on the incoming ball. Now, this level of decision making is really, really interesting. We use it a lot talking about trajectory. So what we want from the drop shot, is the first thing is, we want the ball to be on the rise. So as the ball bounces up, the ball's coming upwards, we take our racket above the height of the ball, we travel along the same plane as the ball, so we can chop underneath it so that the racket ball travel on the same plane for as long as possible is the way that you're gonna get that nice sweet contact, cut around it, chip it over the net. The second thing is, and it seems maybe counterintuitive, but you want a quick ball coming at you. The reason for that is we are decelerating the ball and the quicker we can decelerate it, the better our drop shot is gonna be. So we want a ball bouncing up, we want that ball quick so that we can cut underneath, we can stop that ball, we can slow it down so it just chips over the net. If you want to find out how to play the best drop shot in the right situations, more details about when to play it, how to play it, check out our YouTube channel for all the information. Give it a try, let's know how you get on. If you're watching this video, you're almost certainly on YouTube, which means you've probably watched lots of other videos from other coaches giving you great tips and um, analyzing pros, the Federer forehand, the Isna serve, exa for example. All well and good, really, really positive, but you have to remember you are not them. There's things that they can do that you can't, and there's things that you can do that they might not be able to. Think about a professional tennis player training all the time. Chances are very, very stiff, probably carrying a lot of injuries. So you have to ask yourself really carefully, do I want to mimic this exactly? And am I even able to? We are not as coordinated as professional tennis players. So learning their exact techniques doesn't really make sense. Rather than trying to copy someone else, develop your own game.
Hi guys, Josh from Pitch Tennis. I'm here today to give you all three things to take to your next tennis lesson. So one thing as a coach happens all the time is a new player will come to us or even a player that you've been seeing for a while will come and they'll ask you, what do you want to work on? What do I need to do? And it's much more powerful when the player themselves knows their game and knows what they want out of their lessons. So these are the three things. Thing one, we need to know the level you're competing at and what you want out of your competition. What are your goals? Are you trying to get into a particular team? Is it singles focused, doubles focused? Are you trying to win the club tournament? Knowing that and target setting is really important. Number two, what do you feel about your style of play? How risky do you want to be? Do you want to be an attacking player? Do you want to be more defensive? There's no point us starting trying to add loads of power to your forehand if that's not your style of play and not how you want to do it. So that's really important to know as well. And the third bit of information is not what shot you want to work on, but when to do those right shots. It's all well and good us being able to teach you the perfect cross court forehand, but if you always struggle about when to do that and what situation to do that in, that's the information that we really need to be able to make the biggest impact on your game. So there you go. Next time you're having a coaching session, take those three bits of information and your coach will love you forever. If you enjoyed this video and want some more, please like, follow and subscribe. Hi everyone, Josh from PH Tennis, and I'm afraid today is a bit of a rant. I've had enough of listening to mainly club tennis players say, oh, I've hit the ball so hard, they're so good. Oh, oh, I played doubles and they kept floating it high and lobby and slow. They're so bad. It's irrelevant. It's not about the, the look of the ball. It's about what it does. It's about its outcome. There is no such thing that says fast equals good. Slow equals bad. Short equals bad. Deep equals good. That's so simplistic. It's such a, a, a low level way of thinking. We need to be way more sophisticated. We can all do that. We can all use common sense to go, but it might be short and really spinning. Maybe my opponent hates high, slow, floaty balls. So that's what I'm going to give them. Doesn't mean it's bad. It means it's effective. So you need to make your decisions based on what's effective, what is the right thing for you to do at that time, and not play out of this ego that hitting the ball harder and faster is good and hitting the ball slower and spinnier some way would be bad. So next time you're watching somebody, don't get distracted. Don't think, oh, they hit the ball so fast, they're so good. Look beyond that. Can they hit the ball high and slow? Can they hit it hard and fast when they get a high, slow one? Think about if you're defending, someone smashes the ball in the corner. Do you go and smash it back? No. You play a nice defensive little push, little prod. Does that suddenly become a bad shot? Of course it doesn't. It's the right shot, it's an appropriate shot. You're trying to make the most optimum decision that you can all the time. And sometimes that will mean hitting the ball fast, sometimes it will mean hitting the ball slow. That isn't a good shot and a bad shot, they're the right shot, and that is what we need to do. Hi guys, Josh from PH Tennis. I'm here today to give you a quick serving tip on how to aim your serve. So the one problem a lot of people have is that when they try and hit a, a T serve or a wide serve, they actually have a different serve for it. And we just want to have one serve that we can use and just change our stance. So if I'm serving down the T, I'm going to set up both feet the same and play my serve. If I now want to serve out wide, I keep the same spacing, but I move slightly over, which changes my line. So now my same serve will go out wide. Now you might think that your opponent's going to spot what you're doing and change. But from our experience, people are not that observant, they're not that attentive, they're thinking about themselves and what they're going to do, they're not looking at your stance. If you walk up to serve and you stand like this and do a serve, or if you come up to serve and stand like this to serve, the person on the other end is not going to notice a difference. But you in your head know, ah, this is my wide serve, this is my T serve, or maybe it's your body serve. If you enjoyed that tip and you'd like to hear more, please like, follow and subscribe. Hi guys, quick tip here, and this isn't really a tip, this is more behind the scenes of what's going on in a coach's mind while they're coaching you. Do your mistakes always happen the same way? If that's the case, you probably need to fix the actual shot. So if your shot's always going in the net, there's probably a technical thing to change, maybe change the sensation to make it work. Or maybe you spray the ball everywhere, maybe you hit some long, some wide, some in the net. If that's the case, working on an actual shot in a close scenario isn't going to help. You need to look at the actual positioning and your reception skills about how you're getting into position to play the ball. So that's the tip. Think about the type of mistakes you're making, the variety, and that's how you know what to work on. Hi, it's Javier from PH Tennis, and today we're going to be talking about the backhand slice. Um, so essentially, I've seen a lot of videos explaining 
very, very, very detailed ways on how to do it, but not much on, well, two key really important things before you hit a backhand slice, which is when you do it and why you do it. The when is understanding what situation you are in on the court. So are you in a situation where you're defending? Are you in a situation where you're attacking? Or are you in a situation where you're comfortable or uncomfortable? It's, it's understanding what um, situation you are in the court and deciding what type of slice you're going to use. So for example, if you're defending, you're probably going to use something that is a little bit more floaty, aimed a little bit more towards the middle, so you have a bit more time to get back to the middle. So the sensation with that is probably not going to be as if you were attacking, where you're trying to really chop through the ball, really put a lot of, um, a lot of grit and a lot of, um, of force on the ball um, in order to get that ball to really cut through the court. So it's understanding when, when the difference on those types of shots are having to be played. With the why, so the why is understanding what is happening down the other, other side of the court. So I'm defending, I'm using a floaty shot to get it over the net, but my opponent is already in the middle of the court. Then it's probably not the best idea to go to the middle of the court because I leave so much space open. So what would be my other option? Well, to try and maybe aim for a little bit more angle, to maybe chip it or make it a bit slower, a bit higher, a bit loopier, uh, for it to be more complicated for the other person. And the same with the, the same with attacking. Yeah, if, uh, if I know my opponent is really good at passing me down the line, then I'm probably going to place my slice either into his backhand side where it's a bit weaker or really cut it so it makes it really awkward for that person to, to be able to attack on it and he has to lift it up. So really seeing what is happening down the other side um, and using that to choose what type of slice we're going to use. Okay. So for example with that one, where I had to move back because I'm defending. So the type of slice that I'm using there is almost like a float type of sensation in order to get that ball to go fairly low with, with, with still with slice. So it has an effect on the other person, but it allows me to have time in order to get back to the middle. Yeah, and that allows me to stay within the game. Okay, nice. So for example, with that one, so the situation that I'm in with that one is attacking. So the big difference with that one compared to the previous one, I'm getting the racket high uh, so I can really chop down, keep that ball low on the court. So if my opponent does get to it, because the ball is so low, he's going to have to lift up so that I can get onto the uh, onto the volley or he has to lift it up so the ball that comes in is a bit, is a bit slower. So it's the intention with that one is to try and take away time because he's forced to have to pull the ball up because um, otherwise he'll be knocking it into the net. Okay? Um, if you like the tips, uh, please like and subscribe for uh, all the awesome content that we do. Hi, Joe from PH Tennis. Now, you hear a lot on tennis courts. I imagine all over the world, something along the lines of, why can't I just do that every time? The reason that you can't do that every time is that because every time isn't the right time to do it. There are so many factors involved in tennis court of which you have no control over. So I can't control the ball that the opponent's given me. So that time that you managed to line everything up and crush that forehand winner down the line, everything probably lined up for you in exactly the way you wanted it. The ball was on the right trajectory for the swing path that you chose. The ball was spinning in the way that you wanted to. Your opponent was positioned in a particular place. There are so many things that need to be right for you to be able to do something every time. And that's what we're always very aware of, trying to do something that you should do, so the way you should play, the opportunities you should take. We say the only thing you must do or you should do is adapt. The fact of the matter is, you're never gonna get the same ball twice. You're never gonna get the same ball twice. So be happy with the adaptation of being able to nail that one down the line because you got yourself into the right position, everything lined up and you recognized it and you did it. Don't try and replicate it off every other ball because that's what you want to do. Every single ball you get is gonna be different. The height of the ball is gonna be different, the depth, the spin, the speed, all of the ball characteristics are gonna differ shot to shot. So adapt to them and make more correct decisions. Celebrate the times you get it right 
learn from the times you get it wrong. And that way we're going to improve our tennis really, really quickly. If you like it, or you don't like it, comment, follow us on Instagram, subscribe to us on YouTube, and get more and more content to improve your tennis. Hi, Joe from PH Tennis. Everybody wants to hit a better kick serve. We're going to do a couple of things to help that today. So you often hear coaches talking about a brush sensation, brush. And while that's not completely incorrect, we would say that the brush is just a little bit too gentle, a little bit too soft. We want to try and rip it. So we're going to rip the felt off that ball as we cut across it on that, on that top angle. So as before, we're going to load from the ground, rip over that ball, get that ball dipping into the court, bouncing left to right. So we're going to keep the racket head speed really quick. We're going to rip over that ball. Give it a try. Let us know how you get on. Like, follow, share and subscribe for more. Do you want more power on your serve? Of course you do. Everyone does. You might hear coaches saying, bend your knees. Now why they're saying bend your knees is you want to load into the ground. GRF, ground, reaction, force. The more we load down, the more we can fire up, the more pop we're going to get on our serve. over the fence. Do you want to get more topspin? We've got three key tips into doing it. One of them you've probably heard before. Two is a little tweak on something. Third one you've never heard before. So the first one is we're going to drop the racket below the height of the ball. Racket underneath the height of the ball, coming out the back of it. Everyone knows that one. Second one, we're going to talk about sensations. We're playing topspin, so we've got a family of sensations. That could be a roll, a brush, a rip, if we're attacking. That's what we're, that's what we're focusing on, the sensation of how it feels. Everyone knows how that shot's gonna feel. We wanna focus on that feeling. Rather than focusing on the, the mechanics of it, we are think about the feeling of it. And the third one, and this is the one that you haven't heard before, wait for the ball to drop. If you wait for the ball to bounce, reach the peak, and then start dropping, that gives you a chance to drop your racket so it's traveling along the same plane as the ball come right up the back of it. The steeper it's dropping, the steeper you can make your swing, the more topspin you're going to generate. Let the ball drop, rip up the back of it, create loads of topspin. Give it a try, let us know how you get on. Hi guys, Josh from PH Tennis. I'm here today to talk to you about the rhythm of tennis. Now this is what we use to help our reception skills, our skills that we have when the ball's traveling towards us to make sure we're getting in the right position to play the shot. And this is how it works. I imagine the incoming ball is gonna bounce there. As I set up and I'm waiting, the first thing I do is move to the ball. And part of that move is a turn. So I move until I get behind the ball. Once my strings have located the ball, I stop. And now I can play my shot, whichever shot that might be. So the rhythm is turn, move, stop, and play. There you go, give it a go. Hi guys, Josh from PH Tennis. I'm afraid today a little rant, uh, and this is all about patterns of play. Now, I watch a lot of YouTube videos on, of tennis coaches giving advice and giving tips, and lots of them are great. There's one that seems to be becoming more and more prevalent, which is people uh, setting up drills and activities to help you develop patterns of play. Serve out wide, hit to the open space. Serve down the tee, narrow the angle, come to the net, serve and volley. And whilst in principle, they're hard to argue with because they're using geometry, they're using evidence to show that if you move someone out, then you're gonna create open space. But there's so much more to it when you're making those decisions on a court. You can't predict what your opponent's gonna do. Maybe their ball will be spinny, maybe it'll be high, maybe it'll be low, maybe it'll be short. Maybe the wind suddenly blows and changes, so you have to defend and you have to adjust your idea. If you stick too rigidly with a pattern of play in your mind before a serve, and you just do it no matter what, chances are it's gonna go wrong because the ball won't be where you want it to be, or it won't be uh, the right speed or the right spin or the right location, or maybe your opponent recovers really quickly and the best thing is to go back in behind them. You just don't know. So having a really rigid set of patterns of play 
whilst might give you some confidence going into the match that you know what you're going to do, it doesn't allow you the chance to adapt. It doesn't allow you the chance to problem solving and find the right solution to that situation that you're in. And that's not the match situation, that's that individual point, that individual ball, that's the situation and that's the thing that we have to give credibility to and credence to to make the right choices. If you'd like to know more, please like, follow and subscribe. How many times have you, have you thought yourself or said yourself or heard someone say, God, I wish I could play like I do in practice. That's not, you need to improve your match play. That's you need to improve, improve your practice. Your practice is what the problem is. So you need to change your practice environment to closer match your match environment. If you always practice in a relaxed, easy way and then compete in a really intense way, those two sets of skills aren't gonna come together, they're not gonna translate. So the next time you hear someone say, God, I was hitting so well yesterday, or, oh, I need to just go hit some balls, I've got a match tomorrow, maybe actually think, is that gonna really help? Is that gonna help them? Were they better off playing a shorter practice match the day before against someone else? Getting used to making those decisions, being in their environment, playing their situation, and starting to be closer and closer to what you're trying to get to. So that's the tip. Don't aimlessly play, don't aimlessly hit balls. So when you're practicing, you need to make sure that you have some purpose with it, that you know what you're trying to get out of it. Are you playing some points? Are you trying to practice a certain style of play? Are you trying to practice your serve and volley? Something that you can then use in that match scenario. So make sure you have purpose in your practice and you're not just aimlessly playing. That is how you improve your match result. Hi everyone, Ben from PH Tennis here and today we're going to be talking about British tennis sensation Emma Raducanu. More specifically, why we think that 2023 is going to be a good year for Emma Raducanu. So we think this is because of a technical change that she appears to be in the process of making. So if we go back to 2021 here in this first clip and we watch her forehands, they seem to be quite long, quite languid, tip of her racket is popping up above her head every single time and you can see that some of these blows, some of these shots we would call glancing blows, they're not particularly heavy, her trajectory choices are off, especially on the rising and the flatter balls. And then if we skip through to last week, which is November 2022, you can see a very different forehand, much more compact, much more explosive. She appears to have reduced the swing length, brought the skill gap down and is getting more force into a smaller swing. So this is an underrated trait amongst higher level players is their ability to change and their willingness to change, especially after considerable success. So we think that this is a very good sign and bodes well for Emma Raducanu in 2023. Hi everyone, Josh and Joe from PH Tennis and we're here today to talk to you about the most fun shot in tennis. The tweener. The tweener, we love it. Now, a lot of people think it's quite simple. You get lobbed, you run back, you do a tweener. That's your opportunity. There's a little bit more to it than that and that's what we're gonna talk about now. When the ball comes over your head and you're running back, you wanna get the ball back over the net and in the court. Um, yes, we might wanna hit that nice showboaty tweener, but we've gotta make sure we're selecting the right one to do it on. If we can get round to the side and play it, an easier kind of push forehand, we probably should do it and just kind of chip it back. But if it's actually the only way to run back on the line of the ball, the tweener becomes the right shot. The key for a successful tweener is that the ball is slightly flatter. If you've got a ball that's very steep and bouncing up really high, you can't run over it. And we're gonna talk about how you have to do the tweener in a minute and this will make more sense. But you need to run over the ball and you can't do that if the ball's bouncing up high. You need it to be a bit flatter and a bit lower. Absolutely. If the ball does bounce up high and you're running back, it's actually the little over the shoulder flick, swat, that becomes uh, the best option. So the when, at the net, getting lobbed, running back, on the line of the ball, and it's actually quite low and quite flat. The why may be that it's the easiest shot to play. And I, and I, and I think that's the case. It's, it's often seen as a showboaty shot, but in actual fact, for me, it's often the optimum shot for me to play because I can chase the ball straight down. I can line myself up straight with it. I don't have to worry about getting around it. 
um, and I can play that. The other why, using the way that Nick Kyrgios does often, is because it's fun, it looks good, it can wind up your opponent. Get inside their headspace. And there's nothing better than getting a tween a winner, let's face it. Exactly right, yeah. So, now for the how. So, more, to, more often than not, if you're chasing down a lob, you've been at the net ready to volley. So you're likely to be in continental or chopper grip. So I would keep that grip for my tweener. And when I'm chasing it down, that's the grip that I want. With that grip, you're then gonna, Josh, if you just give, me, mind give me a little bit of space. Oh, that, jo yeah. cho from the chopper continental grip, we could probably take the racket to about head, head shoulder height so that we can get the racket with some velocity down between our legs. It's no use just having the racket low and trying to flick because you probably won't get enough enough power on it. So rack it up here so you can swat down below your, beneath your legs. I also think that it's, again, to protect some of the more delicate areas in the body. Important that we let the ball drop low enough that we can get the racket out of the way of those delicate areas and also get a better contact on the ball. Up here and high, dangerous. Very dangerous. The most important tip, I guess, and thing that people do wrong when they start trying to do tweeners is where the actual contact is between your racket and the ball. So a lot of people think that a tweener is a shot that you play through your legs, and you don't. The ball never goes through your legs after the contact. You actually run past the ball, reach your racket back through your legs, and play the shot the other side of you. So like, you a, of, like a normal shot? Yeah, if you think about a normal forehand or a normal backhand, you've got your body, you've got your contact, and you've got the net. And a tweener's, there's no difference. You've got your body, you've got your contact, and the net. It's just your body's facing the other direction. So you still have to have that element the same you do on any shot. And that's the biggest tip. Get beyond the ball, your racket travels through your legs to make contact behind you. That, my friends, is the tweener tip. With all our sensations, it's somewhat dependent on you and, and, and how you feel. For me, it's kind of a swap, maybe with a little bit of a flick at the end, but it's, it's certainly you need to get that velocity. And that's one of the key things, right, with the tweener, is it, you, you kind of have to go for it. You can't sort of, you can't sort of half play it safe. It's you've, it's kind of all or nothing. Yeah, it's another good tip. You, because you don't have, there's no kind of body weight into it that you might have in a normal shot. It's all kind of forearm and arm. So, yeah, it requires you to to commit to it, chopping down, whipping down, flicking, swatting, whatever. However, that kind of feels to you. But yeah, your racket needs to travel with some speed because you've got to create a lot. Often you're going to be back behind the baseline. You're probably going to have opponents at the net. If it's actually going to work, it needs to either get right up under and, and lob up or it needs to be quick and, and, and pass them. So it's definitely one that you, you have to commit to, for sure. Should we give it a go? Oh, I'd love to. Hi everyone, this is a video about style and substance. That actually it was inspired by a message from a client and the message was about having to play an opponent that she knew and she wanted to get some advice on what tactics to use. And her reason was she said, oh she got a lot better, she technique's much better, she's hitting the ball harder. And our kind of response to that was, who cares? Technique and style don't determine the outcome of a shot, don't determine the outcome of a point. There's style and there's substance, and we're all about substance. Now, style, technique, how you actually play the shot, this is what a lot of people worry about. They think, oh, do I have the angle of my racket correct on a take back? Um, do I have my feet in exact right position? When I recover, do I cross over perfectly? It doesn't matter. As long as your outcome, as long as your substance is there, you're doing the right thing. If the ball is in, it ain't wrong. You need to think, is my outcome correct? Is, it able to, is my ball able to do what I want it to do? Can I play it low and fast? Can I play it high and spinning? If you can do those things, then your technique is fine. It might not look like Federer, it might not look like Nadal. If your outcome is good, it's fine for you. So then there's an interesting problem here, right? That maybe the outcome isn't what you want. Maybe you want to add some more power. Maybe you want to add some more spin. Maybe you want to add the ability to aim your shot better. Now, you're going to do that by, you guessed it, altering your technique, changing your style a little bit. But we're not doing it for changing sake, we're not doing it to look more aesthetically pleasing, we're doing it with the outcome in mind, the outcome is your focus, the substance of your game is your focus. And you make sure any changes that you make don't affect your outcome. So next time you think about changing it up, changing your style, changing your technique, just think, 
Am I going to damage my outcome? Am I going to damage the substance of my game? So if you're going to make changes, do it over time. Do it slowly. Make sure you're not taking away anything you've already got. Add to your game. Don't take away from it. So remember, substance is what counts. Outcome is what counts. Style, whilst it might look great for the cameras, is not going to help you win. I once asked another coach, how do I serve like Nick Kyrgios? And his response was to say, why don't you get a new spine? And that's just it. I don't have the same body as Nick Kyrgios, as you might be able to tell. My shoulders might be bigger. Your shoulders might be bigger. You might have stronger legs. You might be taller. You might be smaller. You might be thinner. You might be fatter. So we say don't mimic a pro's particular shot. Don't mimic Nick Kyrgios' serve as much as you might want to hit the serve like Nick Kyrgios. Watch our videos on some serving fundamentals and develop your own game. And I would say this not just for pros. I would never tell someone, oh, serve like me. I'm not going to teach you to serve like me. I'm going to give you the basis by which you can find your own serve. I promise you, by developing your own serve, rather than mimicking someone else's, you're going to get much closer to the results that you want. There might be elements of Nick Corris to serve that really work for you. Maybe tossing the ball where he does works perfectly. Maybe his stance works perfectly for you. You can try these different elements, but you don't have to take the whole package. You don't have to try and mimic the serve exactly. Try things out for yourself. Move your feet around. Does that feel more comfortable? Does that feel more comfortable? Does moving my foot into pinpoint work for me or does the platform work for me? Not taking little bits and trying things, that's totally fine. Mimicking something, a, a pro shot in its entirety or your coach's shot in its entirety, seems like madness to me. Give it a go. Develop your own game. Let us know how you get on. Hi everyone, Josh from PH Tennis. This is a video about warm-ups. And we did a video on danger words quite recently. And actually, when we were planning this video, we actually thought warm-ups should probably be on that list as well. When people say the word warm-up, they think it's about them. They think it's a, a physical um, activity to get ready to play. And actually, there's four stages of warming up. We do have our physical warm-up, and this is the first thing that you do. For some people, this would include some running, might include some, some sprints, might include some stretching. You then have your calibration. This is your actual tennis shots. This is when you're getting on the court, you're starting to go through the motions, getting your sensations, your different shots ready. And then, this is where everyone thinks it begins, is the warm-up, the five minutes before a match starts, when you're with your opponents. Now when I say this, you're going to think it's quite common sense really, that when you have an opponent on the court with you, you shouldn't be warming up. You need to be playing how you want to play in the match. You need to be setting that level and that expectation to them that this is, this is what you do and this is how good you are. It's your chance to analyse your opponent. So we've got our physical warm-up, our calibration of our shots, and then we have our analysis. This is the third section of the warm-up before you start playing. So we're going to give them some high balls, some low balls, obviously some forehands and backhands, some with heavy topspin, some with some slice. We're going to see if there's any areas of their game that we can exploit later in the match. And that word exploit, that's the fourth and final bit. When you're in the match, you're looking to exploit. We warm up, we calibrate, we analyse and we exploit. And that is how you should get ready for your matches. So, how you can actually use that. The next time you're about to play a match, Maybe you've got a club uh, doubles match. Get down early, half an hour early. Do your physical warm up. Get calibrated in a nice, relaxed environment before your opponents are there. So then, when your opponents are there, you are on it. You are ready, ready to win. Within that analysis section, there's one bit that's particularly important, and that is the serving section. Now, if you hadn't hit any serves before, you need to really focus on getting that serve going. But because we've done that, we don't need to. We can start to think about our return of serve. Now the easiest game to break in tennis is someone's first service game because the chances are they won't have warmed it up fully, they, won't be, they will be, still be a bit cold. So we need to make sure we make all our returns early on in the first game. So during that, during that analysis stage, during that traditional five minute warm up, we're working out how close we're going to stand, how far back we're going to stand, do they have a heavy slice, are they lefty, do I need to adjust my position? And that means when we get into the game, we can make more balls early on 
you're quite likely to get a double fault thrown in there from an opponent if they're serving first they haven't warmed up properly and you can nick that early break and that's a huge advantage to start fast and set yourself up for a successful match. If you'd like to know more about the return of serve, we do have a video about how you work out different positions, how to return kick serves, fast serves, and the slight alterations that you can make. But remember, for the purpose of this, our warm-up, forget the word warm-up. We have a physical warm-up, we have a technical calibration, we have an analysis of opponents, allowing us, with all those three things behind us, to exploit our opponent's weaknesses and win more matches. Give it a go and so you get on. Hi everyone, Josh from PH Tennis. This is a quick video about what I like to call your skills gap. Now this was something that I said to a client in an individual session a few months ago, and it was a little bit of a throwaway comment to be honest, but every week he keeps bringing it back up and saying, oh I forgot about the skills gap, I forgot about how important it was. And so I thought it'd be good to make this video so in case one of you guys finds it as helpful as he does. And in its essence, all it is is the distance that your racket goes back in relation to the ball. So if you have a big swing, you need to have, requires more skill, more timing to make a good clean contact. So the bigger the distance, the bigger your skills gap. So the opposite of that is obviously if your racket is really close to the ball, it requires much less skill, much less timing. So you have a smaller skills gap. And what I was really getting at with this client was that you have to be honest with yourself. You have to kind of get over yourself, not play with ego, not try and have a big swing like Federer all the time. But understand your level understand the situation that you're in. If the ball is fast or deep or challenging or you're under pressure, then your timing is going to be much harder. So you've got to reduce that skills gap. You've got to be honest and play the situation that you're in. So next time you're on court, think about maybe in the warm up, start with a smaller skills gap and then build it up as you get more comfortable, as you get more confident. You need to make sure you're being honest with the situation that you're in. You're playing with a, with a, a genuine skills gap for what you need to do. And hopefully that'll cause you to make less mistakes make more balls, win more points, win more matches. Give it a go and let me know what you think. All right, last one. Great, cool. So if we have a little look at your return, uh, there's a few really simple things we can look at first. Firstly, where do you think is the right place to start? Uh, in terms of left and right, sort of right foot along the inside timeline. Yeah, and how about how far forwards and back? But it depends usually I'm about here. What was that first word you said? Usually. It depends, right? It, depends, it completely yeah. depends. And you might have a really fast server, you might have a slower server. It might be a first serve, it might be a second serve, it might be the second game of a match, it might be the 20th, it might be tired. So you have to continually adjust how far forwards and back you are based on kind of your best guess and your best estimate of what you think is going to happen. The key is to try and get yourself in a position where within one step you can meet the ball at the peak of its bounce. You want to be able to plan the shot as best you can. So with these fast first serves you're probably looking at a, a, maybe an aggressive block, maybe a bit of a push but something that's quite compact with no swing. So you need to adjust how far back and forward you are. So within one step, you can meet that serve at the top of its bounce, and then just you can just play that nice, simple push return to get you back in start at that point. Hi guys, Josh from PH Tennis. I'm here today with the three key elements of all tennis. First of all, we have our sending skills, our technical skills, sensations, directions, angles, where you're playing your shot. Second, we have reception skills. That's your movement, your judgment, getting into the right position to play the actual shot. And then finally, we have our transition skills. This kind of sits in between, and this is decision making. This is the most important part, and one that most people don't think about. It's how we link our sending skills and reception skills together. So there you go, your three elements, make sure you're working on all three. If you enjoyed this tip and liked some more, please like, follow, and subscribe. So, the underarm serve. Some controversy, is it okay, is it acceptable, is it sportsmanlike? We are fully behind it. It's a great tactical move, and the threat of danger you have from a big server to be able to drop in that little short one, the way Nick Kyrgios does, fantastic move, we're all for it. Okay, so a little bit of disguise. We're gonna approach as if we're going for a normal serve, then we're gonna cut, drop the ball, 
cut around it, get that ball going away from your opponent. Approach, bit of disguise, drop the ball, under it goes. Love it. Underarm serve. Let us know if you approve. Like, comment, share, subscribe. Let us know what you think. Hi everyone, Josh from PH Tennis and I'm here today to teach you all about the Rafa Nadal forehand and how we can all create the same amount of topspin. Hang on a second. It's Rafa Nadal's forehand. I'm not Rafa Nadal. So maybe I can't exactly copy him. Maybe I can't use exactly his technique. Um, but let's have a look. There's some different elements of it that we can certainly have a look at. So first of all, he does, he's got that big grip, but I'm, I don't like that grip. Um, Okay, so I can't use his grip. Some of you might be able to use his grip, but I don't think I can. He's left-handed as well, so that kind of ruled me out and about ancient of the population. Um, uh, all right, his follow-through is kind of like a lasso, isn't it, around his head. So he does that for me. Um, so I guess, guys, what I'm trying to say is that, yeah, whilst there's elements of the Nadal forehand that we can try and copy, his grip, the racket speed, the whippy follow through, maybe it's not the right thing for you. Maybe you can try the grip for a bit, see if it works. Maybe it will suit you. Maybe if you play on clay courts and you can stand really far back and let the ball drop low and whip it up, it'll work for you. Maybe you're a lefty. But for a lot of us, we're not gonna have the right physique, we're not gonna have this level of strength, flexibility, endurance to play like that, power to create that much force, that many revolutions on the ball. So we need to try and find our own game and our own forehand. And yes, there's ways we can increase the amount of spin we get, and they might be similar. We might get inspired by the way that the Dow does it. But we need to find our own way. Use your own body and your own set of skills to create the outcome that you want. So there you have it. Don't just copy. Be your own person. Be your own player. Build your own game.